Welcome to episode 101, 101 of the uh, Diffuse Congruence podcast, the American Muslim Experience. Uh, I am joined by my co-host, Omar Ansari. Hey, Salaam Perez. Alaikum Salaam. Good to see you, Omar. Good to hear from you. Um, how have you been? How have you been doing? Well, uh, it's, it's been an interesting couple couple weeks, uh, aside from the fires in California and uh, and everything else. Uh, unfortunately, my family was hit with uh, COVID nineteen, so we we got uh, we we got tested positive, and we're just dealing with it now. So uh, I'm sharing that. So hey, maybe folks can do some dua for me. I'll I'll, I'll take it. I would really actually really appreciate it. Uh, but aside from that, um, happy to share a little about it, just so people can maybe benefit from it and just be reminded to take this thing seriously. Yeah, you, uh, I mean, alhamdulillah, like everyone is sort of on the mend, um, you and the family. Uh, symptoms have kind of varied. Uh, what are you kind of feeling, experiencing? Yeah, yeah. So about two weeks ago, my wife got like stomach flu symptoms. Um, she lost her sense. We were having, of course, uh, of all things, Shalimar. Uh, those of you in Fremont know Shalimar is like a famous Pakistani uh, restaurant uh, takeout type place. And she couldn't taste the the, the, the chicken tikka uh, she was eating. She said it tastes like cardboard. Before that, we had thought it was just a stomach flu or cold. And that was like a red flag. So she went and got tested. Uh, in the interim, the kids broke out into fevers. Um, this is on on uh, on uh, um, on Labor Day. And then I was I was actually okay. I'm like, hey, maybe I'm, you know, maybe I'm going to be all right. And I, when I went and got tested, they did the whole stick the swabs uh, way up your nose and count to 15 and, you know, your eyes are watering and whatnot, but I uh, did that. And, um, and then I'm actually not that, I wouldn't say I'm on the mend while well, the family, alhamdulillah is uh, everybody else in the family is getting, getting better. Uh, but I'm, I'm only on day three of symptoms. So uh, I basically have, thank God, alhamdulillah, no fever, no respiratory issues, but it's like stomach flu. It's basically like the flu without a fever, body aches, stomach issues, um, you know, headache, malaise. So far, I also have my smell. Uh, unlike my wife, I didn't lose my sense of smell. So I can, uh, you know, we do the cumin test. We take the most spicy spice <laughs> cumin and see if we can smell it. Uh, so anyway, so that's what's going on. And um, inshallah, I won't, you know, they say, obviously, uh, it could get worse before it gets better. But uh, I'm just praying for uh, having more mild symptoms than, than other folks have had. Yeah, no, inshallah, um, prayers of Shifa for you. Um, you um, uh, have the doctors given you anything other than just sort of, you know, go home, get rested. Uh, yeah, I mean, vitamin I've, I've been, I've been, uh, <laughs> I've been packing the vitamins. The doctor said if it gets worse, that's when you let us know, right? Um, if it gets to a point you can't breathe or you're having any breathing issues, thank God I'm not so far. Uh, my wife, nobody had breathing issues or anything. It was, it was, uh, the worst my wife had was dizziness and um, uh, headache and loss of smell. Right. So yeah, that's that's uh, I, I we were I was probably the most part as you remember I, uh, I in the spring I was like the guy who was washing my gallons of milk and changing my walking with my right foot and not letting my outside shoe touch the, the ground. Right. I was like the super 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 careful guy, but it just happened. We were traveling a lot uh, between Washington and, and California because of. Uh, just our house renovation happening, which I've alluded to before. And I, hey, you just who knows where it might have been a counter, it might have been the airport, it might have been um, a, a, an Uber to the airport, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, could have been, could have been any one of those. But yeah, like I said, uh, inshallah, shall we? You know, in the next few days, we'll hopefully be on the app. Yeah, hopefully by inshallah by the next recording, uh, you'll be uh, fully on the uh, on the uh, amend uh, there. Um, so. Uh, wanted to kind of situate us. Uh, we're recording towards the tail end of the month of Muharram. We're about, I think today is the 25th of Muharram. Um, this is sort of a continuation of our series uh, of conversations that we've had. Um, thank you all who reached out to us uh, with feedback and with uh, uh, praise, uh, essentially, uh, for our uh, conversation that we had with the Imam Hadi Qazwini. Um, we wanted to follow up, and uh, I'm sort of delighted to in introduce our next guest, who is no stranger to the show. In fact, um, I'm going to just throw this out there. Um, uh, first guest of the show 
to repeat uh, for a third time. So uh, either we're doing something right or we've just been really, really lucky to have him back on uh, and, and he's always agreed. So uh, Omar, why don't you tell us a little bit about who our guest is? Absolutely, absolutely. So again, welcome uh, Ustad Dr. Ali Atai. Uh, Ali Atai is a perennial student and researcher who's been involved in interfaith activities for over two decades. He holds a master's in biblical studies with a focus on New Testament and biblical languages. He also holds a PhD in cultural and historical studies and religion from the Graduate Theological Union. His doctoral work focused on Muslim hermeneutics of biblical texts, especially the Gospel of John. And he lives in San Ramon, California with his wife, Roya, and three daughters. So welcome to the show, Dr. Ali Atai. Thank you. Good to be back for a third time. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so, you know we're, we're always excited, and uh, I, I know in the past we've had you, uh, you know, on the show to kind of talk about Christianity, uh, more of a sort of interfaith conversations, um, and and you know the audience as well as uh, us, we've, we've we've benefited Im immensely from those. Um, so I thought we this would be a little bit different. I know uh, something that you would probably consider a little bit outside of your wheelhouse or area of expertise, perhaps. Uh, but I would contend that, you know, um, I, you, you are perfectly suited in a sense that um, not only given kind of your background that you touched upon uh, on the first episode, but to really kind of have a conversation a, 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 that, that is related to an intra-faith uh, issue uh, between kind of the Shi'i and the Sunni tradition. And I say that um, because, Dr. Atai, uh, your background, actually, your family background is something you had mentioned the first time we had this conversation, um, you come from a Shi'i background. Your family is or remain or is still sort of Shi'i. Yes, my, my parents are practicing um, Shi'ites, to use the Latin sort of suffix. Please. Um, or Shi'a, I guess we can say. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, growing up, we were, you know, like I said, you know, typical sort of Iranian. So <laughs> no, no religion really anywhere, kind of freedom to do whatever we wanted think however we wanted. Um, uh, but as my parents got older, they rediscovered their, their sort of roots, um, their Shiite roots. So they're, you know, they made Hajj in 2006. Um, and uh, they're, they're very devout Shia uh, now. Um, so for me growing up, however, um, uh, I actually never really considered myself um, uh, a, a Muslim until I got into college mm -hmm. uh, and then the brothers I met initially were Sunni and they sort of again sort of took me under their wing and and, and taught me uh, Islam uh, and then over the years of course I've had sort of great conversations with my parents on on certain things and you know what's the significance of this event in history how do you interpret this verse what about this hadith things like that um, so that's that's where I stand right now yeah, I mean, you know, off air, you made the caveat that, like, l this isn't sort of an area of study or expertise for you. Um, but not only just given the family background, but I would, I would, I mean, as someone who is really a deep student of history, um, I think that uh, I think some of the the touch points that we want to focus on in today's conversation, um, you know, it would be really nice to hear your thoughts um, because essentially. Couple of, I wanted to make two clarifying points and then um, kind of dive right in. And that was related to the last episode or the two-parter we did with Imam Kozwini, um, is that um, for the listener, someone, some may have heard my question or my line of questioning as uh, kind of questioning Sunni orthodoxy around some of these historical issues. And I wanted to clarify that that wasn't the case. I mean, I'm not... I wasn't sort of trying to uh, place any doubts on the Sunni narrative or the Sunni approach to these the historical events that we touched on, but rather it was really, as I had said at the outset of the conversation with Imam Hadi Kozwini, that this was not meant to be a uh, debate. We weren't there to debate uh, Sunni points of theology or uh, Sunni uh, the Sunni approach to some of the historical uh, historical events that we talked about. So it was more of, of being able to be deferential uh, to our guest and give him the opportunity to 
uh, really essentially lay down the narrative of early Muslim history according to the Shi'i sources. So I wanted to clarify that from some of the questions that I asked, not for you, uh, Professor Atayi, but rather just mm. for the listener. Um, mm. Number two, with regards to this particular conversation, where I think it's more meaningful to you, uh, Dr. Atayi, is that the purpose of this show is not to have you on to sort of offer the Sunni refutation, right, to the points that were raised in the last episode. This is not a polemic, uh, a polemical conversation. Again, we're not here to sort of do that. That's not the approach that at least I want to take, uh, and I imagine all three of us don't want to take. It's more of a kind of a deep dive or as deep as we can get, given time constraints and so on, um, into kind of the uh, Sunni perspective on some of the issues or some of the events that we focused on last time. Right. That's good. Great. 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 So I think, uh, Omar, I don't know if you had any thoughts or any comments you wanted to make. Otherwise, I'd be happy to kind of dive right into it with Dr. Atai. Yeah, no, I, I just want to echo that. Like, I just saw it as emptying our own cup of understanding and just mm. trying to understand and learn in that conversation. We weren't coming with our own um ideas to the table they were not that we were undermining our ideas we just put them to the side so we can learn mashallah that's a good approach to come as an empty vessel and be willing to um to listen to another another side with respect i mean i don't think there's anything wrong with that at all i really appreciate you saying that dr tai because i know as someone like yourself who's been involved in just countless um interfaith uh, you know, conversations. I've seen you at some of these events. I've heard, I've seen you online at some of these events. Um, you know, one of the approaches that I take in the limited time that I've been in these kind of spaces is to allow the other side, whoever that may be, whether it's someone of another faith or even within our faith, uh, in the case, uh, in, in this case specifically, to kind of um, discuss their tradition, their theology, their approach in their own words, rather than trying to frame the conversation based upon, in this case, a kind of Sunni uh, narrative or a Sunni perspective, and then have the quote-unquote Shi guest asked to respond to that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, I, I mean, I imagine that's, you know, in, in kind of the interfaith gatherings that you've been in, um, I think that's like when you are engaging in a conversation, would you kind of agree that that's probably for a better conversation, makes for a better conversation? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, Jidal is with Ahlid Kitab, right? Thank you. We debate with Ahlid Kitab. Uh, we can engage in a type of um, munadhara with our Shia brothers, you know, kind of disputation. Uh, so, so the difference is essentially that we agree on broad-based principles with our Shia brethren. There's, there's no doubt about that. We don't have to prove that the Prophet wasallam is the messenger of God. Now, that's something that we both agree on. You know, one time I was at a, at a Shiite masjid. It was a large Islamic center, and I was sitting there. It was a big round table, and I was just sitting there minding my own business, and the this, this Shia brother from across the table, I don't know what, what, what was it about me, but he kind of looked over to me and he said, are you a Sunni? I don't know how he just, maybe he just intuited. I don't know how he did it, uh, but I said yes, and then he started to sort of engage with me a bit polemically, right? Uh, and then he started saying something about Abu Bakr as Siddiq and, uh, and um, you know, the whole table was like 10 people that are looking at me. And I said, look, you know, I said, look, if an atheist walked into this, we was, we're actually in the sort of a cafeteria area. And I said, if he walked into this cafeteria and he started to um, criticize the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, right, we would both stand up and address his his speech, would we not? And he said yes. And I said, hey, khalas, we don't we don't have to engage in this type of polemical conversation. Um, so we, certainly we can engage in munavara. Like we can we can look at sources. We can you know we can uh, have re with 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 all due respect. We can disagree on these on these issues. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, I would say that. Uh, th that level of respect has to be there, um, and um, and uh, we should. I mean, the, the greatest the greatest ulama in our classical period uh, could not figure out some of these issues, you know. So we're not going to figure it out, you know, today. And you know, and, and today there's a shortage of ulama. 
I mean, people don't know really what it means to be an alim anymore. Today we have wa'av, like we have these preachers. And an alim and a wa'av are completely two different things. Uh, so like a, like a preacher, um, I mean, you just compare, like look at Christianity. You know, you have these televangelists who are preachers. Some of them don't even know like primary biblical languages. I don't know how they're interpreting text. They've, I mean, they don't, they don't know a lick of Greek. And the New Testament is in Greek. And then you compare that to like, you know, a, a, an alim or a, 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 um, a Franciscan friar or something who has a PhD uh, in, 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 in Christian theology or in Christian history. I mean, they're like worlds apart, right? So oftentimes they'll have a wa'id on a minbar who will say something, um, you know, very divisive, you know, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate because uh, they have such a sway over the hearts of the awam, of the laity. Mm -hmm. And the lay person, he'll, he'll listen to this preacher and think, well, he sounds like an alim, you know, he has the appearance, he looks like an alim, he's got the, you know, he's got a turban on, he's got a beard going, and, you know, he's wearing a thob, and, you know, he's, he's, he's got to be an alim. And, but then he'll say something so divisive, so it's, it's a bit misleading and actually leads to more type of, um, hostility and animosity uh, between the groups. Uh, so, I mean, that's that's unfortunate. You know, I'll give you an example. I heard a, a Sunni scholar one time say, or Sunni, sorry, not scholar, a a wa'ith, a yeah. uh, a preacher. He said from the minbar. He said, he said, uh, talking about Yomi Ashura. He said, uh, this is a day that we fast upon, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he recommended us to fast. And if some random historical events happen to happen on this day, uh, then that's fine. I mean, is that how you're going to talk about Ahlul Bayt? I mean, to me, that's um, uh, it's it's very disrespectful, you know. And um, it's almost like an intention, yeah, like being intentionally uh, obtuse or what have you, like just, yeah. just confrontational, right? Uh, uh, where, and, and I, I, I alluded to this on the last episode, which is like where, you know, trying to, like, like we say, like owning the libs or owning the like conservatives, it, it, we engage in that kind of same conversation where it's like, I'm going to do something that is, I'm going to essentially troll my listener because mm -hmm. I'm just trying to own the Shia. I'm just trying to own, you know, and so that, that type of conversation. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I yeah, and often, oftentimes when I get when I give a khutbah, I'll, yeah. I'll quote I'll quote a hadith um, where uh, I'll I'll praise a member of the Ahlul Bayt, you know. And there's there's several hadith like this. Oh yeah, and and then I'll get people after the khutbah come to me and say, you know, what? are you are you a Shiite? Right. Or why are you quoting Shi sources? Why are you quoting Shiites? Or what, what book yeah. of hadith is this from? And, I said, and you know, this is from Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, so on and so forth. Oh, really? I've, I've never heard this hadith. And it's like, well, you haven't heard of a lot of hadith. I mean, that's <laughs> that's a pretty terrible argument. Right. You know, I haven't heard this hadith, therefore it doesn't exist. I mean, that's called a non sequitur. And, it's, and uh, so I, I tell them, you know, you should learn some logic before you learn some hadith. Uh, but these hadith are in our tradition. Yeah. You know? Um, so it's, um, and, and there's so many of them. Uh, so, uh, we, we, I mean, we just have to, we have to embrace, we have to embrace a sort of larger, uh, understanding of our tradition as Sunnis and it, you know, in this kind of tit for tat type of, right. uh, you know, polemical Polem back and forth is it, just, it's not helping anyone. It's not really convincing anyone, you know, and that's why Imam Malik, he said, you know, Jidal is with Ahlid Kitab. You know, you debate with Ahlul Kitab. But even when you debate with Ahlul Kitab, you know, the Quran lays down the rules. That's right. You know, bil hikmati wal al hasana, right? With wisdom, and the ulama say here the meaning is with with uh, scriptural and rational proofs. Wal al hasana, with good comportment, with a good attitude, with etiquette, with adab. And that's with Ahlul Kitab. Imagine, you know, engaging in a disputation or munadhara with our, with our Muslim brothers that are Shia. What type of adab should we have? You know, uh, so um, especially when when the sacred symbols of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala uh, are involved, and in, you know, the, the Ahl al Bayt is a sacred symbol. You know, and in in Sunni Islam, you know, 
one enters into a state of kufr by denying that which made him Muslim to begin with. So, for example, someone denies the existence of angels or something like that. Right. But also, disrespect of the sacred symbols of God is is kufr. Like, for example, thro- someone throws a mushaf into the garbage or something, or someone like desecrates the Kaaba, something like that. Or someone who uh, slanders and desecrates and, and, and disrespects the Prophet Wasallam or his family. I mean, this is extremely s- serious, right? In my teachers in Yemen, and I studied in, in Tarim a, a bit, and I went there because, you know, probably per capita, the largest concentration of Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet Wasallam in their Husseini Ahlul Bayt. And uh, I heard from many of my teachers that... Um, that there are many examples through history of, of people having a su al khatima or someone putting themselves in danger of a bad ending of their life uh, because they slandered or said something negative or they, uh, they insulted uh, the Prophet ﷺ or a member of his family, mm-hmm. right? So, I mean, we have to be very careful. I mean, Abu Bakr Sadiq, right? He has a famous hadith in Bukhari. He says, Urqubu Muhammadan fi ahli baytihi. You know, and that's coming from Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. This is sound hadith. So, you know, something like be extremely vigilant, right? Be carefully attentive with regard to Muhammad and his family, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. You know, um, so, I mean, love of Ahlul Bayt, um, stressing the love of Ahlul Bayt, this is a cornerstone of, of Sunni Islam, at least as how I understand it. And this is not something that, you know, oftentimes, um, there, you know, there, there are certain things in the religion that some critics will say, oh, you're taking this from Christianity, you're taking this from Judaism, you're taking this from Hinduism, things like that. Oh, you're taking this from the Shia, this kind of, this kind of uh, um, uh, attentiveness or res- high respect of Ahlul Bayt. No, this is something that is, uh, almost agreed upon to be a command in the Quran itself, right? That's in Surah Ashura, right? The Prophet ﷺ is, is commanded to say, no reward do I ask, no wage do I ask of you, except the love of the qurba, except the love of the family. And multiple Sunni Mufassirin celebrated Imam Qurtubi, Imam Tabari, even Ibn Ajiba, many, many others. They say this is um, the Qurba is, is the Prophet وسلم, and his Ahlul Bayt. Mm. Right? So this is something commanded in the Quran. Imam Shafi'i was, was, um, he, was uh, he was so uh, um, incredible in his love of Ahlul Bayt and in his expressions of love of Ahlul Bayt. People thought he was some Rafidi Shia or something like that. You know, and he, he said he said in, in, in a poem, he said, uh, Ya Ahl Bayti Rasulillah, Hubbukum Fardun fil kitab min Allah. I might get the I might get the syntax a bit wrong. Man la Yusali Alaikum, Man Lam Yusali Alaikum La Salata Lah. You know, that O oh, family of the Messenger of God, O oh, prophetic house, your love is obligatory upon us according to the book of God, according to the Quran. Um, and whoever doesn't doesn't send benedictions upon you, there's no prayer for that person. So Imam Shafi considered that a, one of the one of the arkan, like one of the pillars of the prayer, is a salah ala nabi wa ala ahlihi, mm. is is sending blessings upon the Prophet sallam, and his family and his folk. That there's no prayer if one does not do that. Um, so this is something that is just. Um, you know, it's 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 something that is is part of our tradition. We can, and, and and to downplay it for the sake of this tit for tat polemic is just ridiculous, mm-hmm. and, it, and it's petty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I I was going to save this for the for the end of the conversation, but I mean, I, I really appreciate you kind of going into it. Um, right. So, I, I guess what I wanted to ask Dr. Atai is is mm. you know where does that sort of impulse or that need to uh, I guess, you know, be polemical and, and to the point where we call into question being too devoted or showing or expressing too much fidelity or love 
to Ahl al-Bayt. Um, where does that come from? I mean, is that something that, I mean, you know, because one of the things we talked about, uh, and I'll, I'll just kind of, kind of name it or call it, mm. call attention to it on the last episode, which is that, you know, one would find among Sunnis, generally speaking, and again, this is being, you know, sp- sort of painting in broad strokes, that people who um, identify with or come from a tradition within Sunni, S- Sunnism that is of uh, Ahl al-Tasawwuf or people of uh, su- uh, like a, more of a Sufi tradition, that generally speaking, um, you know, conversations around Ahl al-Bayt uh, are, are, are more abundant in, in those kind of settings or those kind of, you know, that kind of frame or point of view, as opposed to, let's say, someone who comes from sort of another tradition within Sunnism. Like, would you generally agree with that? Um, yeah, I, I, I think so. And it's I, sad. I mean, it's, it's, it's a sad testimony to, of yeah. the fact of where, yeah, but anyway, yeah. sorry. And I think a lot of it comes from uh, sort of, these kind of cultural wars that happen um, in certain places around the world. Um, so people are sort of indoctrinated into thinking a certain way. Uh, and it's unfortunate because, again, they're, they're sort of sacrificing the tradition uh, for the sake of this kind of cultural uh, understanding of things and this kind of polemical discourse that they want to keep going. Uh, so, you know, there, there, there are people now, there are Muslims now that will deny things like the second coming of Jesus, right? This is sort of catching fire online. And, and uh, I mean, it's reported by something like 30 Sahaba, right? So it's, it's like Tawat al-Ma'ani, you know, it's, it's like uh, multiply attested, at least in its meaning, maybe not for every word in the hadith, uh, but to d- deny something like that. And, and the, the excuse that's given is, you know, this is an emulation of Christianity. We're, we're taking this from Christianity. It's the same in Christian. Well, it's not exactly the same in Christianity, uh, but the second coming, I mean, yeah, the second coming of Christ is something we have. That doesn't mean we took it from Christianity. Again, this is just a, a horrible argument. We have something in common with Christianity, therefore we took it from Christianity. The Quran calls Isa alayhi salam al-Masih, and that means Christ. You know, the Jews don't believe he's Christ. The New Testament calls him Christ. Does that mean that, that oh, we're, we're taking this from Christianity? Um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. So, in other words, there are some Muslims nowadays that, you know, even if it, if it smells like Christianity, they want nothing to do with it. If it smells like Shiaism, you know, then we want nothing to do with it. We'll, we'll say, wait a minute, this is a sound hadith, or this is accepted by the majority, the jumhur, or even the ijma' of the of, of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. No, 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 no. This, this, no, this is probably Shiite, you know, type of influence that has crept into, um, and that's just having a bad opinion of 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 Sunni scholarship that they can allow all of these sort of offuscations and the, all of these sort of deviant ideas from Christians and from Jews and from Shia to come in and then Sunni ulama, they don't know what they're doing. So they just sort of assimilate it and appropriate it and, and make it part of our aqidah. So it's, it's, it's really, un, it's really unfortunate, you know, and I've, I've experienced this, like I said, you know, yeah. I mean, if you, if you look at our sources, you know, there's a hadith that says that I've left two weighty things behind me, the famous hadith, hadith thaqalain, it's called, Right. And, you know, the book of God and my sunnah, right? And that's actually a, a, a weaker hadith that's right. than the hadith in, in multiple books, Tirmidhi, in Ahmad, in the Tarikum Fikum Athaqarin, Kitab Allah, Hablun, Mamdunam, in Asama, Ila, Ard, Wa Itrati Ahl al Bayti. That's right. And the close members of my family. This hadith can be argued to actually reach the level of Tawatur. Right, uh, reached a level of mass transmission, um, but you know it's it's sort of like you you quote this hadith in many Sunni circles, unfortunately, and they think you're a Shiite. It's it's so strange to me. This this is a cornerstone of our tradition, you know. And they say, well, h- how come there's a contradiction? I don't think there's a contradiction between these two hadith. You know, if you look at if you look at the world right now, the vast vast majority of the descendants of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah. <laughs> the vast, vast majority. So sometimes they set up this paradigm, it's a false dichotomy. Are you going to be with the with the caliphs, you know, these these caliphs, or are you going to follow Ahl al-Bayt? Somebody once asked me this in a Shiite masjid. 
they stood up and said, why are you going after, that's how he put it, why do you go after these, these, these khalifas and not, not Ahl al-Bayt? So I said, first of all, I said, well, who are the khalifas? And he said, Umar, he said, Abu Bakr and Umar. I said, keep going, Uthman. Keep going. He said, Ali. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's not an absolute dichotomy. And who is it? Hassan was, was the caliph for six months. And he, he abdicated to Muawiyah. You know, he wanted peace amongst the Muslims. And this is something that Shia ulama, they, they admit that he, he willingly gave up the caliphate to Muawiyah, who's supposed to be this horrible, terrible guy, apparently. Uh, very, very strange. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the itra of the family of the, of the, uh, of the Prophet ﷺ, this is something that is, that is absolutely fundamental, our love for them uh, in, in our sources. Um, so, I mean, that's something uh, that, we, that we need to stress. You know? Absolutely. Um, and, and I appreciate you kind of mentioning that particular hadith where, where, where you said that uh, it's often translated or uh, the kind of narrative is, uh, you know, hold on to the book of Allah and my sunnah, right? I leave behind two things. Um, and I, and I, I mentioned, again, the variance that you, that you mentioned, which is, um, you know, the, that what, what the prophet says is I leave behind the book of Allah and I had a debate. And, and so, yeah. and, and more specifically, we were talking about the uh, event of, and, and we'll kind of dive into it here, mm -hmm. which is of Ghadir Khum, right? Where yeah. the prophet makes the, the, the sort of famous tr uh, tradition um, that is reported by both Sunni and Shi'i sources, فَمَنْ كُنْتُ مَوْلَى فَعَلِيُ مَوْلَى, right? Where mm. whoever takes me as a master should take Ali as a master, or Mawla. Um, I, I'm, I'm doing the mistake of sort of translating Mawla, where I think that kind of is the real crux of the debate or the, or, mm. the, or, or the crux of the issue between the Shi'i interpretation of that and the Sunni interpretation of that. But mm. that statement is followed after a khutbah that the Prophet delivers, mm. um, you know, at Ghadir Khum, where again, he emphasizes these two things that I leave with you, the Book of Allah and Ahl al-Bayt. And so yeah. um, that was the kind of conversation that we had, or that was the context of, 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 of why I brought that up. But if you could then maybe yeah. kind of talk about yeah. from your perspective or your understanding of uh, Ghadir Khum and where uh, really, I, I mean, I would submit that the uh, one of the, at least one of the major areas of the point of departure between Sunni reading of history and Shi'i history, or I should say specifically the Shi'i reading of history kind of uh, branches off with regards to the events of Ghadir Khum or the, or the statement of the Prophet. Yeah. Man kuntu mawla fahadha aliyun mawla. Yeah. Right. So, you know, mawla comes from a word meaning to be near to someone. Okay. Right? So the Quran says, an nabiyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. <clears throat> that the Prophet wasallam is nearer to the believers than their own selves. Um, so if, if Ali is near and dear, to, if I am near and dear to you, right, then Ali should be near and dear to you. No, I have no problem. I mean, you can read into that if you want and say, this is my political khalifa to come after me. Um, but I don't necessarily read that into what he's saying here. You know, Ali did not make the Hajj. Ali did not, was not in Mecca. He was in Yemen. Yemen. And he was trying to catch up to the Prophet ﷺ and he missed him and he caught him halfway between Mecca and Medina at this pond called Ghadir al-Khum. And apparently, according to our sources, the men, his men in Yemen had already divided up the Ghanima, right? The war booty. And Sayyidina Ali, because he was so scrupulous about this type of thing, he said, we can't do that. You should not have done that. Uh, this is only for the Prophet Sallallahu to divide. So you need to, because they had taken some clothes. And so he said, put your old clothes back on. And this uh, started a, a sort of, um, like sort of a grumbling about Sayyidina Ali amongst his own men. So people were very upset with him. Mm -hmm. And apparently some of this grumbling had reached the ears of the Prophet ﷺ. Mm -hmm. So Sunnis would look more at the context of the statement, right? That people are, they're saying negative things about Sayyidina Ali. So the Prophet ﷺ, uh, he addressed the issue. You know, if I'm near and dear to you, then this Ali, then he is, should be near and dear to you. I have absolutely no problem with that. 
whatsoever. Did, did, did Sayyidina Ali understand this to be uh, the Prophet Sallallahu giving him his temporal authority in sort of this, in, in a clear-cut sort of way? Now, now according to our sources, uh, according to our sources, Sayyidina Ali, when, when the event happened at uh, Saqifah Bani Sa'ada, he felt like he was slighted. This is true. This is mentioned in our sources. Um, uh, so before we get to Saqifa, because that was uh, certainly a point that I wanted to discuss with you, um, yeah. going back to this idea of, uh, is that statement that is made at Al-Ghir, is that something that alludes to, or perhaps even explicitly, uh, assigns Sayyidina Ali as being the, uh, successor to the prophet? Mm. One I mean, of the points, or one of the questions that I asked last time uh, on the last show, which is, uh, was that one would think that something as, uh, uh, what was the word? If, if something as important as what was to happen to the political authority after the prophet's death, that that would not be left to sort of happenstance. That that would be something that the prophet peace be upon him, would have would have taken upon himself to leave behind explicit instruction for, right? Because we find that, for example, leadership, and I, and I quoted this, that even in the context of two people traveling, the prophet says that you should assign an emir, right? You, you should pick one who, who who is the leader of that group or of that, uh, you know, of the journey. So why would the prophet leave something as important as successorship to happenstance, but that he would be rather very explicit about it. So how do the, what is our, what is Ahlul Sunnah with Jama'ah's position with regards to that question of leaving something as serious as that, uh, not just to be implied in a statement, but rather be explicitly stated? I mean, it's, um, the, the Quran says, وَأَمْرُهُمْ شُرَى بَيْنَهُمْ Right? The Quran sort of gives this um, fundamental principle that we should conduct our affairs, especially political affairs, by some sort of mutual consultation. Now, there's, there are certainly um, indications that Sunnis mention where the Prophet sort of indicated that his, his successor would be Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he led the Prophet in, in prayer during the Prophet's final illness. The Prophet, during his final appearance in the masjid, he ordered all the doors of the masjid to be sealed off except the door of Abu Bakr because presumably he's going to enter the masjid and lead the prayer as the imam, as the khalifa. Uh, wallahu alam. But this was a time, I mean, the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Sayyidina Anas, he says, I mean, there's this d d darkness that descended upon the city, right? Um, so this was a time of, of, of just, um, it was a very, very difficult time for the Sahaba, uh, I mean, Sayyidina Ali, you know, according to our sources, and he's like, he's like, um, I mean, he couldn't, couldn't really move. Sayyidina Omar is, 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 is kind of lost his mind at this point and, and barking threats at people. Sayyidina Uthman is just sort of babbling without meaning. I mean, this was so traumatic, right? Uh, so these are human beings. The Sahaba are not masum. They try to do the best they can. But my, my thing is, I'm trying to understand, like, how did they understand Right. Uh, what the Prophet وسلم, said at Ad Ghadir al to Sayyidina Ali. Sayyidina Ali, he, I mean, everyone would agree that eventually he makes bay'ah to Abu Bakr as Siddiq. I mean, the, the Shia have this narrative of Umar going to the house and trying to burn it or something like that and actually burning it. I mean, there's something that's mentioned in our sources, but. Uh, Tabari, yeah, it was mentioned on the last show. So, yeah, I'm yeah, glad you went. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, can, I can talk about that as well. Um, what, Please. Uh, how they sort of ad lib to that. Um, but. Uh, Sayyidina Ali then, you know, if if he has a divine mandate, I mean, divine man, you know, in, in the Quran, this is what Allah was talking about in Al-Ma'idah 67, O Messenger, convey what has been uh, uh, revealed unto you, and don't be afraid of the men. If Sayyidina Ali has this divine mandate to be the Khalifa, you know, why is he in Medina? Why didn't he declare war on Abu Bakr and Omar who have usurped his caliphate and they're rebels now? Apparently they've apostated uh, because they've gone against uh, a clear verse in the Quran where the Prophet Sallallahu is being told that Sayyidina Ali is your Khalifa. Why is he hanging around Medina? I mean, at, at, at Saqifah Bani Sa'ida, 
there was a man from the Ansar, Sa'd ibn Ubadah, who thought that he should be the Khalifa. And they said, no, you're not going to be the Khalifa. So he left the city and he went to Damascus. I'm not going to hang around you guys. He went to Damascus. But Sayyidina Ali is there and then he makes bay'ah and, he, and he's there for uh, when Abu Bakr passes away. He, he, he's in the sort of inner circle of Sayyidina Umar. And, you know, he gives his daughter, Umm Kulthum, to Sayyidina Umar to marry. It's apparently his, his, his mortal enemy. Uh, and then he's there for Sayyidina Uthman. He's, he's still in Medina. What's he doing there? Mm-hmm. And the sort of response that I've heard is, well, Sayyidina Ali, he's using his hikmah, and it's better right now not to sort of... That, or he's devoted himself with his study, and he was compiling the Qur'an, you know, he was collecting yeah. the Qur'an, and so, I mean... Yeah. It, so, so it was some, in, yeah. in other words, he's sort of using his own wisdom at this point and saying, well, yeah. it's not really prudent. But Allah thought it was prudent, apparently, right? That he should be the immediate successor. So is his judgment above the judgment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I mean, I mean, what kind of, what kind of answer is that? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to say, Ali is your khalifa, and that's how Ali understood that, that I am the khalifa immediately after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but he's hanging around Medina and he's aiding these other usurpers of his, of his caliphate. It doesn't make quite sense to me. Um, but then you have this narrative of, so anyway, I was going to say that initially, yeah, Sayyidina Ali, people. yeah, he felt like he was a bit slighted, right? Slighted. That, you know, we should have had a say in this. This is mentioned in our sources. And then, you know, it, it, it was a situation where, you know, if we don't, if we don't elect a Khalifa that is from the inner circle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then, the, then someone like Sa'd ibn Ubadah, radiallahu anhu, who, you know, is, is from the Ansar, somebody like that could be, become the Khalifa. And we should actually keep this within the inner circle of the uh, of the of the Sahaba, so Sayyidina Umar and Abu Bakr felt it was their duty, as being very very close companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, to go to this meeting. Sayyidina Ali was busy with with um, with others, and they were preparing the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's body for burial at the time. So he did not attend the meeting, the, the meeting. But I don't necessarily, I don't uh, ascribe any type of ill ill uh, intent on on the part of of Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq and Sayyidina Umar. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to me to do that. And then the and then the aftermath of this, uh, where Sayyidina Ali, you know, he he stays in Medina. He continues to aid and support these 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 uh, these these caliphs that supposedly stole his 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 right to be the. the, the and then you have this the 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 narrative, which I believe is is totally fabricated, uh, of Sayyidina Omar coming to uh, the house of Fatima Zahra. Uh, and and, and uh, so ba- there's there's a hadith in the Musannaf of Ibn Abi Shayba, mm-hmm. right? There's one hadith. It, it's in our sources. Uh, it's a Mursal hadith, so it's disconnected. Where Sayyidina Umar does come to the house of Fatima Zahra, Sayyidina Ali and Zubair are not there at the time, and then he basically says that uh, he basically says that uh, your husband and Zubair they need to make the bay'ah to Abu Bakr Siddiq. Uh, or else I will burn the house down upon them, alayhim. And oftentimes this is translated uh, by Shia as upon you, as if uh, as if uh, Umar is threatening uh, a Sayyid of Fatima. Um, and then he actually prefaces the statement by saying, and this is in the hadith. Again, this is a weak hadith. Some say it's fabricated. It's a mursal hadith. But if we entertain the hadith for now, Sayyidina Umar, he initially says, O oh, daughter of the messenger of God, no one was more beloved to me than your father. And after him, no one is beloved to me than you, mm-hmm. than you, right? And then I'll burn the house down upon them. This is kind of a way in which Arabs speak. I don't think he means this literally at all. I mean, there's a hadith in the Prophet Sallallahu He said, this is in our tradition. If people don't come to the masjid and pray in jama'ah, I'm going to burn their houses. Then. Do, you, do you actually think? The Prophet Sallallahu who's rahmati lil do you think he means that literally? I think he's trying to communicate the gravity of such a situation. And of course, he never actually burned, the, the hadith never says that he actually burned the house down. It never says that, you know, Fatima was was beaten by him or something like that or crushed behind the and door. And she would later die from what transpired yeah. just there, yeah. which is I again mean, something that we find yeah. in, I think, some of the Shi'i sources. Yeah, he never threatened her. Um, uh, I mean, she understood that she was never threatened. And if you look at the end of that hadith in Ibn Abi Sheba, when Sayyidina Ali and Zubair come back, 
what does she tell them? She, sa she says to them, ra'yakum, like flee this opinion of yours. Just let it go and make bay'ah to Abu Bakr. And that's what they do. You know, that's exactly what they do. Uh, so, um, you spoke about Sayyidina Ali perhaps feeling slighted. Um, was, because this is another sort of common um, example that is given um, that not only was it uh, Sayyidina Ali, but also Fatima felt that she was slighted, right? That her husband had a rightful claim. Um, and there's the instance of Fadak where she goes and asks for what she perceived to be her inheritance from yeah. Sayyidina Abu Bakr and is denied. Um, you know, the not only the property in Fad or the, uh, I guess, yeah, the... The, the material asset of Fadak, but also from Banu Quraiza and, and sort of some of the other, um, there was some other, uh, I guess, material assets that she was asking for as part yeah. of the inheritance. Um, so was that all sort of cumulative? Was there this sense that she felt slighted? Is there anything in our tradition that yeah. comes to that? No, about Fadak, definitely. She was angered by that. This is mentioned in our sources. Okay. Uh, so regarding Fadak, I mean, it's mentioned Bukhari and Muslim, and it's in a reliable hadith corpus. Uh, so she came to Abu Bakr Siddiq and she wanted the land of Fadak. Uh, so uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq, he, he said to her that I heard the Prophet Wasallam say that we prophets do not leave uh, an inheritance, that what we believe, what we leave behind is uh, sadaqa. So the subtext of that is uh, that you can't receive uh, sadaqa. La nurathu ma tarakna sadaqa. That, to quote the Prophet وسلم, according to the hadith. So Abu Bakr Siddiq, again, I don't see any type of ill intent here. Abu Bakr Siddiq was very, very extremely cautious about uh, not disobeying the Prophet وسلم, Right? He was very cautious. And he actually says in that hadith, he says, in the in the Aksha in Taraktu Shay'an min Amrihi and Azira, that I am afraid, yeah. I am afraid that I might deviate because of, of, um, of going against the command of the Prophet. Right? So he understood, it's not like he had no compassion for Fatima Zahra. Well, too bad, you know, you know uh, you're not going to have it, this type of thing. People read into the text. And especially if, if this is depicted on film or something, you'll have Abu Bakr sort of sneering and, you know, and, you know, turning his back towards her. He was a very, very compassionate, soft-hearted person. And this is the same one who said, Urqubu Muhammadan fi ahli bayti. Be extremely vigilant and cautious. But here, he has a, he has a statement from the Prophet Sallallahu right? He's trying to apply this statement. Now, Fatima, maybe she, she understood that statement if she had heard that statement. Maybe it, it seems like the Prophet ﷺ maybe told her that this is going to be your land. So that's what she has. But Abu Bakr has the statement from the Prophet ﷺ. And maybe she knows the statement and she's thinking the statement is more sort of generic or general in that the Prophet ﷺ was not speaking necessarily uh, as a legislator, right? So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difference of opinion amongst the Sahaba. Again, these pe uh, we don't believe as Ahlul Sunnah Jama'ah that anyone except prophets or ma'asum, I don't ascribe ill in, uh, intent to, to, to either person, especially Abu Bakr Siddiq, because that's the person who's uh, being attacked here by, uh, by the Shia. Uh, and then you have p other people, like Ibn Taymiyyah, right? He writes about this incident, and the Shia, you know, <laughs> they quote him all the time. In Ibn Taymiyyah, you know, I think the statement he makes is, is, is disrespectful of Fatima yeah. Zahra. I've heard that from numerous, by the way, yeah. Yeah, right? Scholars yeah. of like, Sunnah Jama'ah. Yeah, he's like, why is she so angry about some piece of dunya and, you know, whatever misses you could never have effect, this type of, is this how we talk about, I mean, Fatima Zahra, if, 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 if her father, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, told her this is going to be your land, and she, and, she, and, she wants to, and she wants that land because of that, we can't fault her for that. Yeah. You know, we have to be very, we have to tread very, very lightly when it comes to the Ahl al-Bayt. But Abu Bakr Sadiq, he's, he's trying to, m m the way that I look at this entire incident is that he had, he had very good intentions. He does not want to, to, um, to disobey the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
uh, in this in this matter, and his ijtihad um, uh, clashed with 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 Fatima's concern for the land. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. um, but that's 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 the way I look at it. Yeah, um, I mean, and we can keep like I was going to flash. I was going to sort of uh, flash forward to the events of like what happens after the assassination of Uth- of, of Sayyidina Uthman. And, and 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 we can talk about incident by incident, but I think kind of like in if we can step back and take a take a broader view of not only history but more importantly the players that are involved here, the companions yeah. uh, of the Prophet Radiallahu Anhum, uh, is that is so, and, and you've alluded to this, but I mean if you could maybe speak to this more specifically. What is the approach that we take? Because like you said, on the one hand, they are not ma'asum. They, they don't have infallibility with regards to these things. We don't, we, don't, we don't view them as such. They are human. But at the same time, we say, well, we also don't. And I think this is attributed to Sayyidina Ali where, you know, with regards to uh, 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 disputations between companions, we don't choose sides uh, or we don't pick sides. So like, how do we... How do you negotiate that? How do you wrestle between saying on the one hand they are not infallible, but not at the same time falling to the opposite extreme, which is to attribute mal- malice or hatred or, uh, you know, yeah. sort of worldly uh, desires for power and authority? Uh, how do you, you know, how do you, how do you sort of wrestle between those two extremes? Yeah. So, I mean, generally as Ahl Sunnah, our position is that Sayyidina Ali's positions were more correct or the correct position over other Sahaba. Like the, 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 uh, the conflict between Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Muawiyah. Right. I mean. Or Aisha. Yeah, or Aisha. I mean, how, how, many, how many Sunnis do you know that are named Muawiyah? Who names their son Muawiyah? So uh, in other words, we respect him because he has the suhba of the Prophet Sallallahu Right, and the Prophet Sallallahu met him, and he was a scribe of the Quran. Right, but we recognize that when we're talking about Sayyidina Ali, right, Ali and Minni wa Ali. I mean, there's there's this a hadith in our tradition. I mean, there's, there's so many hadith. Why are you quoting right? all these Shi'i traditions? Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> these, Shi'i, these Shi'i traditions that were, that, were, that were related by Imam Al-Tirmidhi and Imam Muslim and Tabarani. And, you know, so we say that this is, this, is, this is our position. Sayyidina Ali's positions were the higher positions. Sayyidina Ali, in hindsight, was, was correct. That doesn't mean... That now, okay, we can we can slander our mother Aisha. What what kind of craziness is that? Our mother Aisha is is uh, our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is buried in her apartment, right? The, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is buried between Abu Bakr and Umar. If these people are apostates, if these people are munafiqeen, if these people usurp Sayyidina Ali's God-given Khalifa, why is Allah putting his Habib in the company of these people? These deviants, these munafiqeen. It's an insult to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's mm-hmm. an insult. Mm-hmm. So this, this animosity, it's read back retroactively. I mean, three of the sons of Sayyidina Ali died at Karbala. Three of his sons. These are brothers of Say, uh, Sayyidina Hussein. And they are named Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman. So if your mortal enemy is a man or men named Abu Bakr and Umar, are you going to name your children? And the response from this, from, from Shia, is, is basically that, well, these are just common names, right? I mean, a common name. If my mortal enemy is named John if my, I have, or, or Michael, I'm not going to name my, my son John or Mike. If it's my mortal enemy who usurped my God-given <laughs> mandate to the divine caliph, to the caliphate, I don't care if they're common names. So a lot of this animosity it's 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 blown way out of proportion. Like we said, Sayyidina Ali uh, felt like he was a bit slighted initially. We dealt with that. And then his own wife, Fatima Zahra, according to the hadith that the Shia used to claim that Sayyidina Omar killed her, there's nothing like this in the hadith. Read the hadith, Ibn Abi Shaiba. doesn't mention anything like this. At the end of the hadith, she tells her husband, Ali and Zubair, flee from your opinion and go make bay'ah. And that's what he does, right? 
because Fatima Zahra is someone is beautiful to listen to, right? Or they say, you know, there's a hadith that says, you know, Fatima to bid'atum minni, faman aghdabaha faqad aghdabani. Fatima is a piece of me, whoever angers her has angered me, right? And Abu Bakr made her angry. Right, I mean, I mean, generally that's a true statement. If you make her angry because you have animosity towards her, if you want to abuse her, you know, if you if you if you have you know ill will against Abu Bakr, did not have that. He he's he's disagreeing with her because he has a statement from the Prophet himself that the prophets don't inherit, and this unfor unfortunately clashed with something that she that she got from her father, the Prophet sallallahu So this was unfortunate. You know, you can't. Oh, oh. So therefore, Abu Bakr Sadiq. You know, Allah. You know, you know, is is. It's it's really so. Uh, my point is, a lot of the animosity, right, is blown way out of proportion, or it's retroactively placed there, just out of whole cloth. It comes out of nowhere, right. Um, so anyway. Uh, <laughs> no, no. I, I th thank you for that. Um, I, I guess you know, and, and I want to be mindful of the time, but a, a, as we begin to wrap up um what then is our sort of position with regards to the historical fact that we actually have a either you can call it a civil war or if you, you know again if you read into it a rebellion like what is taking place between Sayyidina Ali and Aisha Sayyidina Ali and Muawiyah and then, of course, which sort of precipitates into the events of Karbala, which you alluded to, uh, Yazid ibn Muawiyah, right, the, the, who is the son of Muawiyah. So if you want to maybe talk a little bit about that portion of history, and then I think after that we can kind of begin to conclude, we can really yeah, conclude. Sure. I mean, again, it's, it's sort of a... Um it's sort of like my history against your history type of thing. Well, I, I'm actually really glad you say that because, uh, again, the often or one of the things that we do hear from our Shi'i brethren is that, you know, we are reading a sort of um, Sunni hegemony or supremacy, a kind of a, a, a hagiography, as it were, with regards to history, because it's being told by the uh I guess the winner, right? So, but, so are yeah. they ones yeah. in the position of power? Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this, this is again, this, this is strange kind of. I mean, I mean, postmodern philosophers they they approach history like this. They postmodern philosophers. I mean, they're t people are taught this now in university. You can't get to the actual objective truth about anything. Everything's just power plays. Whoever's in power, you know, and wrote the history, then obviously that's a false history. It's just sort of de facto false because they're in power. We have no. I, I don't. I don't agree with this. I mean, we we have to look at the, we have to look at the sources. We have to analyze. I believe that we we can know uh, to a strong degree what actually happened uh, in, in history. Um, so my my issue, however, with Shia historians is that quite often that they will ascribe the worst motives to Sahaba um, that that they don't like. Right, so Aisha, she's a rebel, right? And she and Ali is the caliph, and so she, she, her intention is to go out and fight him and kill him. And uh, you know, uh, I mean, the way that we we regard this incident is that Aisha and Zubair and Talha they went for for uh, for striking a truce uh, with Sayyidina Ali, and then there were agitators in her army actually in both sides that wanted a conflict and actually this, this precipitated into a major, major conflict. Um, you know, and, and so, um, you know, and, and Ali showed her the utmost respect and escorted her back to uh, Medina. Um, and again, if, if this is the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu and everyone agrees that this was the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if, if this, you know, you know, the rebel and this, apparent apostate because if you go against the caliphate Sayyidina Ali which is divinely mandated again you've entered into a state of apostasy this is who the prophet picked to marry this this is his wife you know um this is where he's he's buried uh, in her apartment um so uh it's, it's just they, they ascribe the worst of motives right um and then the issue with Muawiyah again I mean this is uh, again, we recognize that there 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 are problems here with um, with Sayyidina Muawiyah. It's it's no cause to curse him or to insult him. Um, he was a very shrewd uh, politician, 
But again, in hindsight, at the end of the day, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah will side with the with the positions of, of Sayyidina Ali. They, they say that these are the higher positions. These are the more spiritual positions. These are the more enlightened uh, positions, right? So so it's important for us to to recognize that all of these people are in this sort of orbit of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Um, and so to to ascribe to them uh, this this you know this uh, this massive apostasy um, uh, in, in kufr after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. What do we do with all of these hadith that that uh, that praise these people that honor these people? Um, but with with Yazid, obviously, there's a lot more problems, right? Uh, I, I, well, I definitely wanted to touch on that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so that's something that that we. Uh, we um, admit uh, that, that's that's a different that's a different issue, uh, but when we're dealing with the close companions, we're dealing with the companions in general. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam again, they're not masum. Uh, um, they they're they're going based on their ijtihad, and and we should we should have good opinions of them because the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you know, these are his companions, mm-hmm. and these are people near and dear to him. You know, well, you certainly. I think you've certainly helped me as a Sunni as well, kind of put every all the conversations we've been having with the Shia scholars uh, into perspective. Like I, you know, just seeing seeing how our community has kind of forgotten, in a sense, uh, about the, the the calamities of history. Like like you mentioned that that Imam who said something happened on Ashur, right? I, it's clearly that is an extreme and. There's probably, there's yeah. there's there's more remembrance we could do and honoring of of Bethlehem Bayt for sure. But at the same time, I think you've painted a good picture here that this isn't some comic book where you have good and bad people and it's there's one yeah. clear right. There's a much more it's very uh, much more nuance. There's much yeah. more nuance in, in human I mean, nature. In play. I mean, if you look at the look at the tragedy of Karbala, I mean, again, the sort of polemical um discourse that that the the way that this is sort of presented is like it's like the sunnis are the army of the bani umayyah or like the people that are killing imam hussein these are the sunnis and then the people defending imam hussein and dying as martyrs these are the shia i mean these terms did not even exist as we know them today back then I mean, you have Shia Ali, Shia Mu'awiyah. These are political affiliations. They're not theological designations. They did not crystallize as sort of an ideological or theological uh, designation until much, much later. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I mean, how many Sunnis in the world will defend Yazid against Imam Hussein? I mean, it's just it's just a kind of a ridiculous argument. To, I mean, who who actually has that type of aqidah? Uh, and, there, and there might be said too. There might be think, the, yeah. yeah, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, like those that do, it, it's again kind of from this place of 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 a of a polemic, right? It's like saying, oh, well, not only are we going to say that, not only are we not going to say that Yazid had sort of problems with moral impropriety and so on, and that he was in the wrong, but we're going to defend him and we're going to honor him and we're going to sing his yeah. praises. Like that's a that's a that's a tiny minority, you know, right? Of, of people yeah. who are, uh, who would consider themselves Sunni. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and oftentimes, you know, the one who screams the loudest makes the headlines <laughs> or, or the right. one who is the most provocative, right? Um, that, that's who, that's who's going to dominate the sort of discourse. And that's, that's unfortunate because, you know, um, the, again, the, 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 I think it's just clear cut. I mean, I, my understanding of Sunni Islam is that, we love Sayyidina Hussein, that he was martyred, uh, he, he was unjustly killed, and that he is beloved to the Prophet wasallam. and this is attested to in, in many, many prophetic statements of the Prophet wasallam, yeah. uh, and that this was a, a, a tragedy that happened in, in, our, in our history, uh, and that's something that we should commemorate. Uh, so, you know, just because Sunnis aren't going to the Masajid on Yomi Ashura and, and formally sort of commemorating the, the martyrdom doesn't mean oh they're Yazidis now you know you know that's what they that's what they call them that, that's because they hate Imam Hussein it's just like if Sunnis don't go to to a masjid and commemorate the Molid you can't say oh that's because they don't love the Prophet they're not participating in a Molid no that's that's that, that's actually very dangerous because if you say that a Muslim does not love the Prophet I mean that's that's kufr you have to love the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam right yeah. so and at they, the same time. And there's an opportunity for 
your mainstream Muslim, Sunni Muslims to do more on, you know, to celebrate the Prophet Sallallahu and also more to celebrate his family as well than maybe we're doing today. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, I yeah. mean, uh, we kind of gave anecdotal evidence of this, uh, Dr. Ali, like on, on, on last week's episode or the last episodes, which was that, you know, something that you found very common in like Sunni households, like certainly in places like the subcontinent where, um, you know, you, you know, people who were, uh, uh, you know, Sunnis, uh, you know, Orthodox Sunnis would attend majalis during the, you know, during the days of Muharram, even on the day of Ash 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 Ashura, um, you know, to sort of commemorate and celebrate and to, um, you know, mourn the passing and the killing of Ahl al Bayt, you know, of, of Imam Hussein and the events of Karbala. So, like, that's something that occurred without there being sort of these very entrenched lines of well, we don't do that because that's very Shia or we don't do that because that's too Sunni, right? To have that yeah. kind of level of, 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 of engagement is something that you, I mean, you know, is something that was common, at least in my family, like in Omar's family, like, you know, going back, uh, you know, a few generations. Yeah, exactly. Again, it's, it's this idea of, you know, anything resembling the other side, right? right. You know, we're going to reject. We we're going to reject it. Yeah, this type of thing. And so... Uh, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. And I was just going to say that, um, you know, th there's a whole understanding as to, you know, what, who are the Ahl al-Bayt? Mm. Like, like I brought up, I brought up that statement earlier about, you know, our, our mother Aisha, that, you know, it, you know, if she is what the Shia are saying she was, why would the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam marry her? Uh, and um, the, the sort of canned response from many of them is, well, you know, the... Uh, the wife of uh, of um, of Lut alayhi salam, right? Mm. He was a prophet. But if you look at the Quran, you know that that verse of the Quran, "Inna ma yurid Allahu liyuthiba ankum rijza ahl al bayt, wa yutahhirukum tathira," right? If you look at that ayah, look what comes before and after. Where is that ayah in the Quran? You know what's before and after? That's in Surah Al Ahzab. You know. Uh, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only wants um, uh, to remove from you every type of impurity, O people of the house, and render you pure and spotless. If you look before that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing, uh, directly addressing the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is why in the hadith, you know, the two tabi'i, they came to Zayd ibn Arqam and said, are the wives of the Prophet Ahl al-Bayt? And he said, yes, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ya nisa an nabi that's how that section or that passage begins. Oh, wives of the Prophet, you're not like other women. And then you have this ayah. And then after this, that's the, that's the feminine plural, right? And yeah. remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your homes, feminine plural, right? So in the first instance, this is addressing the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the wives of the Prophet, who are they? Hafsa, Aisha, right? Among them, right? In fact, if you look, the, the term Ahl al-Bayt occurs three times in the Quran. Every single time, the first instance is, is, is uh, concerning a wife of a Prophet. Mm -hmm. right? When the angels come to Ibrahim, alayhi salam, you're going to have a son. And then what, what does Sarah say? She says, This is very strange, right? I, I, my husband's an old man, right? So the angels are responding, this is, this is a second feminine singular uh, pronoun in this verb. They're speaking directly to her. Do you, is this, is this ajib for you, O oh, people of the house, right? And then with Musa alayhi salam, when the women of, uh, of Egypt, he wasn't nursing from them, right? So the, the sister of Musa alayhi salam, she goes to them and he says, Hal adullukum ala ahli baytin yakfurunahu? Shall, shall I point you to a people of a house? Meaning a woman that can nurse him for you, mm. right? All three instances. So this idea that, you know, that, uh, that this, this slander of Aisha, you know, and that, you know, because, you know, a prophet in the past, married, but the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the, the Quran explicitly refers to the wives of this Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as Ahl al-Bayt, 
Right. Right. And so again, you know, and um, Omahat. Exactly. Um, had to move and again, so I'll quote Abu Bakr Sadiq back to our Shia brethren be extremely careful, have extreme regard with respect to Muhammad fi Ahli Baytihi, and she's from Ahli Bayt. That's right. And I really appreciate that perspective, especially because, um, you know, we're saying. We're saying prayers on on the on the on the Ahlul Bayt five times a day in our in our in our prayers, right? So, yeah. this understanding has, has definitely helped me, um, and hopefully, inshallah, apply that even as as in my thinking, as in my daily prayers. So, I appreciate it. Um, I I want to I want to conclude with this, uh, Doctor Ali, which is that um, you know, you talked about the fact that you know what what again something that both sides recognize, which is this idea that. Uh, you know the point, the initial at least disagreement or point of departure between Sunnis and Shia mm -hmm. is over a political uh, is over a political decision. However, as these things go, uh, you know they sort of crystallize and over the years have snowballed into sort of theological differences as well. Mm -hmm. And and you know and and I think one of the main sort of again uh, areas where we do see disagreement is with regards to. The infallibility of the imams, so this the, of the imam of the imamate, as it were, or what happens, as I have framed it now, time and time again, is well, if we examine, if, if we look at the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as ma'asum, as possessing this isma, what happens to that sort of divine infallibility, right? I mean, you have the Sunni approach, which is that it it sort of coalesces and crystallizes within the ijma or the jama'ah, right? Hence, Ahl al-Sunnah wa jama'ah, and the normative teachings of the Prophet. That that is what is, uh, it encapsulates that isma or that infallibility of the Prophet. And with this, with the, with, with, with regards to the Shia approach being more of sort of a bloodline uh, and more of like crystallizing between this sort of sequential line of imams, regardless of whether you stop at five, number five, or you stop at number 12. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about this idea of infallibility of the imamate and, and maybe kind of also, uh, because again, we, one of the things that we did touch on was, um, you know, the eschatological position or the eschatological events of the Mahdi and the, again, the kind of difference between si the Sunnis and Shia when it comes to this sort of eschatological figure of the Mahdi. Yeah. I mean, um, as far as the Isma of the Ayyama, yes. The ulama uh, ahl sunnah wal jama'ah they'll they'll say that this is a mistaken belief, so it's it's not something that uh, gives like uh, it doesn't anathematize like the Shia it doesn't make give took fear to them. They would just say that this is a belief that is that is not founded uh, on this on, on strong texts or traditions. Um, but as far as like um, are these are these aimma are they awliya? Uh, of course they are. Um, from again, my from my anecdotal perspective, and I've and I've studied with with ulama, uh, you know that these are these are beloved aimma, uh, Sayyidina Ali, Hassan, Hussein, Zainul Abidin, Ali al Rida, Jafar al Sadiq. Who doesn't respect these people? Who doesn't praise these people? Who doesn't love these these figures? Right. Um, so as far as their wilaya, that's something that is that is established. Um, but are they necessarily are they necessarily uh, protected by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala in the sense that they have this inherent um, infallibility, papal infallibility? Yeah. yeah, I would say that that's it's it's an unfounded belief. And if you listen to sort of fringe elements from the Shia, they take this to extreme levels sometimes. And again, the wa'av, the preachers, you know, they they have a lot of influence among the masses. And I've even heard things that you know the the uh, imma are, are are higher than prophets, and and then you get to things like um, the the Alawi sect that say Ali is Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala that that he is a divine incarnation, right? Um, so uh, and that's where these these kinds of beliefs can 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 lead to. Um, quick question, quick question. What yeah. at what point did the Twelver and and I know we're really uh, close to time and, and don't want to open up too much of a can of worms, but at what point did the Twelver belief come into play in those imams themselves? Like, did any of those imams themselves believe in in the Twelver theology of their infallibility, or did it come later? It seems like it's a much later development, right? 
That's what it, that, I mean, that's what it seems like. I mean, the, obviously there's going to be disagreement between Sunnis and Shia. I mean, the right. Jaffa Sadiq believe that he was an infallible imam. Um, uh, based on what we have from him that's surviving, that certainly doesn't seem like uh, it's the case. Uh, I think I think one of their, I think Musa al-Kadham or something uh, named his one of his daughters Aisha, right? I mean, you have these in, even in, in Shia restor- the historical records. So if this is an infallible imam, you know, why is he naming one of his daughters after this so-called rebel and apostate who, you know, opposed Sayyidina Ali? Um, uh, so it, it it certainly seems like it's a much later development, at least from from our perspective. Of course, you have you know the Shia again; they have their own sources of hadith, they have their own yeah. tradition, usul al kafi, things like that, where they they have these. For example, al kafi is really the first one who who said that Omar killed Fatima by crushing her, you know, between the door. And you know, where does this come from? It comes from their own sources. Where does that come from? Allahu alam. They have their way of sort of authenticating these. Uh, these traditions, but it's certainly not something that's found uh, in our sources. Um, uh, Abu Hanifa, Malik ibn Anas, these were students of Jafar al-Sadiq. Did they, did they ever report, you know, our, our teacher claimed to be an infallible imam? And, uh, no, they didn't. They, they, they loved their teacher. He was the great, great, great grandson of the Prophet wasallam. So we love him. His wilaya is established, right? Is he inherently infallible? That We would say that there's no basis. Yeah. Uh, for that. Mm. Allah Adam. Um, no, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ali. This has been, uh, a, you know, a really uh, fascinating conversation. And I, I, I think a great sort of uh, con- way to conclude the conversations that we've had leading up to this even uh, with regards to our approach or the Sunni approach, I should say, to Ahl al-Bayt and to kind of really read history both critically, but at the same time, you know, respectfully with regards to uh, individuals and, uh, you know, companions where we can attribute human frailty, but at the same time, not attribute malice and and animosity. So I I really kind of appreciate how you approach this in a very nuanced and balanced way. And, And I would just sort of like to conclude with the words that you began with, which is that disputation and debate is even in the most beautiful way is with people of the book it's not to be something that we take you know within our community and so uh we can have these conversations but in the spirit of not only toleration but in the spirit of you know uh, i think respect and plur- and, and and pluralism where we, we you know we can have you know as, as i mentioned last time like we don't have to sort of uh, blend into this monochromatic gray. We can maintain our differences. Black is black, white is white, and we can celebrate and recognize those differences without having to sort of blend into this uniform, uh, you know, monochromatic gray to sort of appreciate differences. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, I think that that that's a really good place to kind of conclude. Um, I don't know if you had any, if you wanted to share any thoughts as we as we close out the episode. Um, maybe kind of going back to some of the points that you began with. Um, I would just say that, you know, the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, he tells us, وَعْتَسِمُوا بِحَبِ اللَّهِ Right? To hold fast to the the rope of God. Right? وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا And do not join a firqa. Don't join an exclusivist sect. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this would be my advice to Muslims around the world. When we go into historical perspectives, there's going to be difference of opinion. Uh, when we go into hadith, there's going to be difference of opinion about you know methodology and sources and so on and so forth. Obviously, there's things that we agree upon, and there are things that I think um, we, we can actually extract uh, the truth from these things. But everyone agrees. Muslims agree. Muslim, uh, Shia and Sunnis, they have a, the same primary text, right? They have the Quran, right? We believe in the Quran. I mean, I mean, Christians can't say that. Roman Catholics and Protestants do not have the same Bible. It's the, there are seven extra books in a Roman Catholic versions of the Bible. Right? We have the same primary text. Let's let's come together on this text. Right? Let's let's understand what this text is saying. Uh, and obviously, again, even among Sunnis, even among Shiites, there's going to be difference of opinion. But at least we can come together on 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 this text and say, 
look, we, res- we, we respect each other. We believe in the text. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a messenger of God, right? And, and uh, the, the, everything else is, is, is just ancillary. It's, it's, not a, it's, not a foundational, it's not a foundational issue. We're not going to solve the issue if it, if it hasn't been solved already. And just to not engage in this type of, you know, this, this kind of polemical discourse that leads to animosity, mm. right? We can state our opinions and we can be very passionate about them. But at the end of the day, Allahu A'lam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all uh, unto the truth, inshallah ta'ala. I mean, and Brother Omar, I hope you feel better, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you uh, and your family um, a, a, a full recovery, shifa and kamila, inshallah. Thank you so much. Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much for the, for, the, for, the, for the talk and for the time. I know we went over, so I really appreciate it. Jazakallah khair. Yeah, um, uh, to our listeners, thanks all, as always for listening. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed this series. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, you know, do reach out to us with any comments, feedback, questions. We'd love to uh, sort of address them um, um, on on the episode. Uh, we are approaching next month our seventh anniversary, so we hopefully have something very special uh, prepared uh, for celebrating seven years of the show. Um, and so, look forward to that. Um, please do check us out on. Our Patreon page, patreon.com slash Diffuse Congruence, where you can become a monthly uh, subscriber and patron of the show. As always, thank you for listening, and you will catch us again on the next episode of Diffuse Congruence.